session what was the final outcome. This one could have been better. And I don't know exactly when the session got off track, but it, it almost... I was hopeful at the beginning. The new Republican majority talked about they were going to focus like a laser on jobs and balancing the budget. And I shared that with them. So I thought, gosh, that's great. You know, we've, we both want the same thing out of this session. And I think we were going along that path. We got some work done on the environmental permitting and then uh, you know, the budget forecast came in and we started to see what the numbers were going to be so we could start some discussions. And it almost seems like all the Republicans at some point figured out this job's just too hard. And, and, and finding some common ground is going to be maybe too hard to do. You know, we just can't get there. And, and it seems like the, the session turned towards a social agenda probably somewhere mid-late April, and the discussion really was very little about the budget any longer after that, and it became about guns and gay marriage and abortion, and very divisive uh, social issues, and the budget almost seemed to become secondary, and, and you know, the discussions with the governor almost never happened. I mean, you never... You never got to the point where you're in the room with the governor going through the spreadsheet line by line. I can, well, I'm willing to do that and I'm not willing to do that. And the problem seemed too big to be able to find a conclusion to. The, the rigidity of the principles of some of the newly elected members didn't give the leadership the flexibility they needed to find some common ground with the governor. And I think it became apparent to him probably about a month ago that I think their intentions were okay. It, uh, and then I think they planned on, because the deadlines were early enough, to take a second bite at the apple and then negotiate an agreement with the governor that included some revenue in, this, in, the, in the second try. And it became very apparent on Valentine's Day when Tony Sutton, the chair of the Republican Party, sent a letter to the caucuses saying uh, no revenue no taxes, no fees, no revenue of any kind that would break the principles of the Republican Party. And so I think the leaders were well-intentioned, but I think they got caught up in uh, a very, very rigid party structure uh, that was unwilling to compromise. I think they have some new members that didn't quite understand the, the and not being critical, but didn't understand really the depth of the problem, how hard it was going to be to reach an agreement with the governor. And what do you say to Minnesotans who are concerned about some of the practical implications of a shutdown? How optimistic are you of avoiding a shutdown? Well, it will depend on the, on the majority's willingness to compromise with the governor. Uh, I mean, it really is all in their hands. I mean, the majority caucuses uh, control the flow of all the legislation. Uh, they determine the agenda, and it totally depends on their willingness to compromise. Have to have a government shutdown and lay off tens of thousands of Minnesotans and and uh, jeopardize uh, programs and services that Minnesotans want and need. I'm disappointed that uh, um, I support the governor. I mean, I believe that. Uh, the wealthiest Minnesotans, the top 2%, clearly don't pay the same percentage of their income in taxes as the, as the rest of us in the middle class. And wealthy people that I know, uh, a lot of them don't have a problem paying a little more. They understand the challenges that the state has. They understand the investments that we need to make in our Cave 12 system, in our health care system. Uh, I don't, I, and I know a lot of wealthy people, but I'll bet if I pulled them, I wouldn't find one that thinks we should we should cut 140,000 poor Minnesotans off of health care, uh, that, that we're going to cut child protection services, all kinds of prog programming for people with disabilities. Uh, the wealthy people I know wouldn't wouldn't support that, and and this notion that uh, the job creators, the business people in the state that they'll move out. I just don't believe that. I 
don't believe that. I know a lot of business people, and the business people that I know, uh, they want their employees to be able to own a home, drive a good car, to be able to send their kids to college. I, I just don't believe that a small number of them that are there are somehow going to abandon Minnesota and abandon the employees that they have and, and move out. I just don't believe it's true, and I don't think the studies bear it out. I, I think it's a it's a popular soundbite that people use, but I just don't believe there's any data to support it.